Hi, everyone. Happy to be here, here at Dynatrace. And thanks a lot to Thomas for being here as well and giving us the opportunity and space to have our event here today. Yeah, first of all, it's great to see you here and also great to have everyone online. So a very warm welcome to everyone in the audience. It's great to have you here in the office or on the stream, wherever you are watching that. And before we actually start into the content, I'll give you a very, very short introduction about Dynatrace. Um, where we are coming from, what's our vision? Our vision is to have a world where software is running perfectly and securely. So what does that mean? Our solution gives end-to-end -end insights, not only on performance or on health, but also on security, AI-powered, so that you see what's happening on, with, for the users, how the experience is, and also about the health of all your systems, wherever they are running, and all the different cloud providers are on-premise. If you want to learn more, I'm here. You can ask me later. There's no product demo planned today. Um, background of the company, we've been founded 2005, so a couple of months ago, uh, so 18 years exactly, by three people in Linz. It's a classical startup story and a success story. Um, we are now way more than 4,000 people worldwide and more than 1,400 engineers working on one product. Um, the solution we do is yeah, automated, AI-powered, and full-stack insights. And when we talk about our target market, so we are focusing on the 15,000 biggest companies in the world. And when we just look at the Fortune 100, so the 100 biggest companies in the world, more than 70% of them are our customers. The likelihood that you use Dynatrace indirectly today is close to 100%. If you bought something online, ticket shop, uh, if you did a financial transaction, we are running in with financial services, uh, in, in, in health services, um, in different areas and also governmental services. And one of our a couple of our customers are, for example, Walmart, one of the biggest online retailers in the world. NASA is also one of them, and a couple of airlines, and just to mention few of them. Coming over to the most important part for the people which are here, housekeeping. It sounds maybe a little bit boring, but it's important. First of all, if you received white cards at the entrance, please return them if you haven't done it yet. Elevators, if you give the cards back, you still can go down, but you won't be able to go up again. So if you want to go down smoking, just let me know. More than happy to <laughs> go with you and join you in. Besides that, if it gets warm, could happen, please don't open the windows. What will happen? Air condition is going to shut off automatically and it gets even more warmer. Toilets, just around the corner on the left-hand side is a white door with the classical signs on it, you will find it. Besides that, we will also take some photos. If you don't want to be on the photo, just let me know. And we may, will make sure when we use the photos on social media that yeah, they are not get posted. Besides that, have fun, enjoy. We have a little, a little bit of snacks. And the most important part is if you want to have a cop coffee, there's the machine and there's the after work fridge. Help yourself and feel at least a little bit at home. <laughs> well, and with that, yeah, giving back to, to Malte. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Thomas. And thanks a lot again for being here. I missed something. Yeah, you missed something. Yeah, if please. You're, you're in the office now. You see a little bit of the office. It's now the time to pick up the, f the phone and uh, scan that QR code. If you want to learn a little bit more about Dynatrace, it's our careers page. And it's the directly link where we get give insights about our office, about how we work and how we do stuff. And yes, for sure, there are also some job postings there. We're having open positions. So just in case, mentioning that, very important and nearly forgot it. Sorry for the extra 15 seconds. No worries. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Thank you Marta, uh, for organizing this. And uh, yeah, I'm really excited to be here. Thank you, Dynatrace, for uh, hosting this location and so on. And yeah, I'm really excited that I can tell you a little bit about uh, Azure Managed Identities and how they can help you to not only deploy an application without any secrets, but also how to run them in Azure without any secrets. Before we go into the talk, just a few quick words about myself. So I'm a Christian. I started programming, I think, in the year 2000, and I've been mostly working with uh, Microsoft technologies. So I've been using classic ASP and then ASP.NET and uh, .NET Core, or now the modern .NET. I've also been involved a little bit in the open tracing uh, community in .NET. And I'm now working at uh, NordCloud as a cloud solution architect where I'm doing uh, consulting for Azure and um, AWS. And I now have uh, about eight years of experience with Azure already. There's some links on how you can reach us uh, as a company and also um, yeah, me personally. 
on uh, Mastodon, for example, and also my small blog. I'd also like to give you a few quick words about NordCloud. So NordCloud, if you don't know them, we are a cloud native company from Europe. We're part of IBM. And for us, it's really important to give our customers uh, cloud native solutions. And we do that with two parts. So we have one uh, section which is the consulting, the professional services, where we do individual projects with all our customers and help them on yeah, Azure, AWS, or Google, or all of them. Many are going multi-cloud. But we also have this uh, section where we do managed services. So with managed services, we are managing the Azure environment, for example, of our customers. So we, for example, have a landing zone product which can bootstrap the process of our customers so that they don't have to set up everything uh, themselves. And also they get uh, updates, support, and everything from us so that they only have to focus on their own um, products. And uh, yeah, we're working with all three hypervisors. And we currently have more than 1,800 people in Europe already. In Austria, we're um, a little bit more than 30. But yeah, we're a remote first company. And in Austria, we're spread around um, all of Austria. OK. Um, I want to start with a few questions just to get you involved uh, a little bit and just to know how much you know about those topics. So if you can answer the following questions with uh, yes, just uh, raise a hand, please. So the first question is, uh, do you have any experience with Azure? So yeah, many of you. Do you have experience with Azure AD and applications, service principles, and everything? So a lot less already. <laughs> and this shouldn't be more than. <laughs> Do we have experience with uh, Azure Managed Identities? OK, so very few. And for Malta, uh, do we have experience with Azure Bicep? No. Uh, no. Anyone? Oh, okay, perfect. So uh, yeah, lots of things uh, we can talk about today. To start the um, talk, I want to give you a scenario. So everything we are talking about later is based on this scenario because we're talking about DevOps and running and deploying things. So I want to picture this scenario. We are building a microservice-based application. It's based on .NET 7. We are uh, using Docker to um, build the packages, and we want to store the code on GitHub. Since we're using GitHub, we want to use GitHub Actions to deploy everything and host it on Azure. And since it's a modern application, it needs a lot of dependencies in Azure. So since we're using Docker, there's Azure Container Registry to host the images. There is Azure Container Apps, which is a service to host microservices on uh, Azure without having to manage Kubernetes. It's based on Kubernetes, but it includes uh, KEDA and uh, other things, Dapper, for example, to give you a serverless um, container hosting solution on Azure. It's not so important for this talk, but just to let you know, when we're building an application, there's many things involved. There's also dependencies. There might be a database a storage account, a key vault, and service bus, for example, for asynchronous communication. And uh, yeah, since we're talking about DevOps, what does a DevOps process look like in that scenario? Here's a very a simple one. So yeah, we want to store everything in code. So our infrastructure and the application itself should be stored in Git. So we are committing this to GitHub, and then there will be a process, GitHub Actions, that deploys it to a container registry. So the application packages will be deployed there. And we will then be able to deploy it into multiple environments, test, production, whatever. And within one of those environments, we have our system running. It's a microservices application. So there is uh, some public ingress. You must be able to reach the application. This one will talk to some internal services. They have their dependencies. And um, yeah, there's many, many things involved in a typical application. So the big question now is, how many secrets do you need 
to deploy and to run this system in a world without Azure managed identities. If you think about API keys and uh, certificates, personal access tokens, shared access tokens, and whatever, you will quickly find that there are many. <laughs> when you deploy from GitHub to Azure, you need some uh, key. When you um, pull from container registry, when you push, when you administrate the container registry, you always need to authenticate. And it's sometimes humans, sometimes it's applications that need access. So I think this is a very uh, important point that should show you why Azure Managed Identities are a really interesting concept. Because with Azure Managed Identities, you get an um, automatically managed application in Azure. And the benefit of this is that you do not have to have any credentials. There is no secrets that you have to manage. Everything is done by Azure. Azure Managed Identities is also really uh, well integrated with the Azure ecosystem. So you can use Azure Managed Identities to access a lot of Azure services already. And it's free. There's no extra cost to using Azure Managed Identities. So there really is no uh, reason right now why you, shouldn't Azure why you shouldn't use Azure Managed Identities nowadays. And that's basically the intro. So we will lo look at this scenario and we will now talk about the different aspects that describe managed identities. So we will quickly talk about what workload identities are, how that fits into Azure AD, and we will then go into more detail about managed identities. I also then want to show you how to use managed identities in your application to access a dependency. So this is for running the system, how to access keyboard, for example. And I want to show you how you can use managed identities in GitHub Actions using a very new thing called Workload Identity Federation. Again, without needing any secrets. And then for the last part, depending on how much time we have and for the Q&A, we will look at a demo, which is a microservice template that I've built um, where we can yeah, look at bigger code and bigger examples if you have any questions. So the first thing I want to talk about is workload identities in general and how managed identities fit into, those, uh, into that system. When we talk about managed identities or workload identities, uh, Azure describes this in two parts. So there is human identities that we all use to access our emails, to access our uh, company accounts and so on. And there is workload identities. And this is becoming more and more. There's so many devices now, so many IoT devices, but also so many applications. We now have microservices, so you don't have one service, you have hundreds and so on. And this part, the workload identities, are what we are focusing on today. And the, the workload identities, they have some special characteristics. I think the, processing, the processes for um, securing human identities are well established. There is conditional access in Azure AD and so on. But for workload identities, it's been more or less Wild West. The secrets, the API keys, they've been spread around many systems. There were no formal processes to handle the life cycle. Many applications need many secrets and so on. So, yeah, there's even a higher risk because of all those things. There's a study that says that now more and more um, attacks are targeting workload identities because they are such a powerful uh, target as well. If you have access to the credentials, you can uh, do a lot of things, obviously. And what's important for Azure Managed Identities is to understand how it fits into the Azure environment. And that's why I want to talk about some concepts, about some words first, like Azure Active Directory and all the things that you see here. Because since managed identities have been brought later into Azure ID, there's maybe a little bit hard to understand the advantages and disadvantages. But I think that's why it's important to understand Azure ID first. Um, so a few of you have said they already worked with Azure Active Directory. And 
Azure Active Directory has an application model. So if you as a company use Azure AD, it's a multi-tenant system. You as Dynatrace, for example, can build your software as a service product in your Azure AD tenant, and other companies can then use your application to sign in with their employee credentials, for example, to do single sign-on and so on. So like we see in this example, the company uh, at Datum, they are building an HR application, and they want to have this in a multi-tenant system. So what they are doing is they are registering an application in Azure AD, but the application is a global object. It lives in your tenant, but that's the global definition, the manifest that says what your application can do. But the application does not live by itself. It needs another object in your Azure AD tenant. And that's the service principle. And if you build a single tenant solution just for your company, you would have the application and the service principle in your tenant. But if it's multi-tenant, you have the service principle in other tenants as well. And this will be important later when we talk about managed identities because I think it's not really clear uh, if you look it up where this fits in. It's also not clear where this uh, fits in in the Azure portal. For whatever reason, they are using different words in the portal. So if you want to see an application in uh, Azure, you are looking at a page called App Registrations. So you would have to go into the Azure AD blade and you would look up the App Registrations page. So here you can see those uh, global applications that you have created where you are the owner. And the local object that lives in your tenant, the service principles, are called enterprise applications in the Azure portal. So if you would use, uh, as a customer of Dynatrace, if you would use Dynatrace and they had single sign-on with Azure AD, uh, you would see them here because their service, pr uh, a service principle has been created in your uh, tenant as an enterprise application. So since I will be referring to these words a few times, I have this uh, summary slide again. An application registration in Azure is where you create an application, you define the global properties, and this will create already some objects in your home tenant, in your company's Azure AD tenant. It will create this application object and it will create the service principle in your home tenant. And if it's multi-tenant, the service principle will be created from the template and it will contain which users from your company tenant will be able to sign in to this application. You as a company can say again what permissions the application should have and so on. So we have application registration, application object, service principle, everything is in uh, Azure AD still not talked about managed identities. So I want to now tell you how managed identities uh, fit in there. So like I already said in the intro, a managed identity is an object that lives in uh, Azure Active Directory and you do not have to manage the credentials. And what this managed identity does is it gives you a way to obtain Azure AD tokens. So whenever you are using Azure AD to access any system, it's using OAuth for uh, creating tokens. So your application, if it was a classical one with application registrations, if it wants to talk to uh, Azure Key Vault, it, was, it would ask the Active Directory tech, uh, tenant for a token, and that token can then be sent to um, Azure Key Vault. And the classical application registration service principle would need the certificate or secret to authenticate to Azure AD. And for managed identities, Azure takes care of that. There's two types, and we'll look into them uh, in a second. There's system assigned and user assigned with important differences. And typically, if you create a managed identity, you would 
first create this managed identity. You would assign it to your service, to your application. You would give it some permissions. You would allow the identity to access um, keyboard, database, whatever. And you would then write some code. You would, in your code, access the database. You would, in your code, access the keyboard. So you need some way to communicate with this managed identity with Azure AD. And that's what you would use the Azure SDK for. Since it's, I think, still hard to understand what managed entities are, I have some uh, screenshots again of the Azure portal. We'll look into PySAP in a second, but this is a screen of an Azure container app. So if we go back to our scenario, we had a microservice application. It's hosted in uh, Azure container apps. So there is one container app, one service that's represented here, and it has an identity blade. And for the first kind, for the first type of managed identity, the system assigned identity, there is a simple toggle in Azure. And you only basically have to enable this, and um, yeah, the application will create, Azure will create a uh, managed identity for you. For this, um, there are several services that support this. So you can enable a managed identity on Azure Container App. You can enable it on V on a virtual machine. Basically on anything in Azure that supports outgoing calls. So if this service wants to reach some other service, you can enable a system assigned identity. But this identity is tied to the life cycle of the resource. So if it's system assigned and you assign it to a container app, the identity will be deleted once you delete the system assigned identity. I want to delete the container app. But this also means that it will be only created once you have the container app. So you enable a system assigned identity on an existing resource. So if you want to uh, assign permissions and so on, you can also only assign it once the application has been created. So you which is an issue because your application might not start in that case because it needs to access the keyboard and so on. The second more interesting um, type is the user assigned managed identity. And here we have a separate process for creating the managed identity. There is a separate uh, blade, a separate service in Azure called managed identities. And there you can create those user assigned managed identities. They are really simple. They only have a name and uh, a location, and that's basically it. Once you have created them, they live in your Azure AD tenant, and you can use them for, for your resources. So now we are back in this container app, the thing that's running our service. We've seen before the system assigned identity where we just had to press the toggle, but here we can now choose from an existing user assigned identity. And here we now have many advantages because since this user assigned identity will be created before or can be created before the container app is created, we can assign permissions to it before the application is created. And it is a standalone Azure resource. So there's uh, some advantages in terms of management and so on, which we, will, which we will be talking about later. And you can assign it to multiple resources. It's not so useful, I think, but maybe you need it. The system assigned identity is tied to one um, service, but the user assigned identity, for example, you could assign to all your Azure policy remediation tasks where you have many, but you can give them the same uh, user assigned identity, for example. Okay, so there's those two things. And I think it's still not clear how that fits into Azure AD. So we, we are, we're going to look back at those screens. In the traditional world, in Azure AD, you would create the application and the registration with the Azure AD blade. So it's a yeah, separate blade. And the managed identity you can create within your resource group with this separate Azure managed identities blade. And 
the managed entities, they are still Azure AD objects. So if you look at enterprise applications or service principles, as is the technical term, and if you filter for the application type, you do not see them by default, you can view those managed entities. So this is the first hint that managed entities live in, in Azure AD. But if we look at app registrations, so where we see the application objects, the app registrations, we cannot find it. And um, yeah, that makes it confusing, I think, because that's why it's so important to understand the application and the service principle and everything. So to hopefully explain this, the, the question is, what is a managed identity? How does it fit into the system? And the answer is, a managed identity is a service principle. So when you create a managed identity in, in Azure, a service principle is created. It's an object in your uh, Azure AD that is created via a different blade. And Azure is managing this. If we quickly go back to this slide, we can see here on the right, managed by Microsoft, the certificate. You do not even see the secrets. You cannot even view them. So yeah, you can see them in enterprise applications. You cannot see the app registration. So why, why are they useful and so on? Um, the, the user assigned identity is a mix, I would say, of being an Azure AD resource and an Azure resource. So if you create them, you can use the Azure Resource Manager, so BICEP or Azure PowerShell, um, Azure CLI, to create the managed identity. If you create a traditional app registration and service principle, they are not Azure Resource Manager resources. They only live in Azure AD, so you need the Microsoft Graph SDK or the old Azure AD SDK and so on. And yeah, this makes it simpler to use because you can use um, Azure permissions, Azure Resource Manager permissions. If you have worked with Azure, there are two sets of permissions. Permissions in Azure AD, for example, you can be a global admin or an application developer to uh, create an application. And then you have Azure roles, contributor, owner, and so on. And for those traditional applications and service principles, you would need an application developer AD role, which is harder to maintain because it goes to your global um, identity team and so on. But uh, for managed identities, since they are created in Azure Resource Manager, you don't need this role. You only need the Azure role uh, to create this. So with contributor, for example, or owner, you can create a managed identity and do not need to communicate with the identity team, for example. But <laughs> managed identities are not applications, which is also uh, interesting, I think. So to make this hopefully clear, we are looking at the scenario again. If you want to build a web application where um, you want to support Azure AD as a single sign-on, so incoming authentication, your employees should be able to sign into the application. And your application internally needs to access some services, then that's not possible with managed identities. Because a managed identity is only a service principle. But the definition of being a uh, single sign on system lives on the application object. You can also not expose an API. So there is in Azure AD, if you go to app registrations, if you create this app registration, you can say, okay, what other, or what permissions, what APIs do I want to expose to other applications? And that's also not possible with uh, managed identities because managed identities are service principles and they only support calling other services. 
So in this case, if you need that, which I think is a typical use case, and I do not really understand why it's not yet supported, you still need an app registration and a managed identity. So I think the important distinction to understand is managed identity is useful when you want to call other Azure dependencies, but you need an app registration when your application can be called. If you have incoming authentication. So if you have that case, if you have a public website with authentication, you will end up with two service principles. And that's really confusing, I think. I hope that at some point they allow you to create a managed identity based on an existing application. Then you would have uh, the best of both worlds, more or less. So yeah, as a summary, again, a managed identity is a service principle an object that lives in Azure AD and allows your application to access other Azure resources. And that's what I want to talk next. How you can use this managed identity to um, call Azure Keyboard, to call SQL Database, and so on. So for this, again, um, we are looking back at our scenario. We are in our microservice solution. We have one container app, one microservice. And that needs to access a key vault. Because yeah, maybe there are some sensitive things still there, or we use it as a configuration store, and so on. We are using .NET, because we will see some code examples. And we will be using Azure BICEP uh, for, for infrastructure as code. So far, I have shown you the portal screens, because I think it's useful to see how it looks like in the, in the Azure portal. But from now on, I want to focus on the automation, how you can do everything with uh, infrastructure as code. And that's why I have this uh, slide here where I quickly want to explain Azure BICEP since very few people um, have used it. We'll see a code example in the next uh, screen, but Azure BICEP is an infrastructure as code language, similar to Terraform, for example, or, or others in a sense that it's a domain-specific language. So Terraf Terraform has its own language, and BICEP also has its own uh, syntax. And BICEP, if you know something about the Azure world, there has been Azure Resource Manager templates. They were a JSON syntax, which was really, really hard to maintain. And that's why they invented BICEP as a more, uh, or as a simpler syntax. The interesting thing about BICEP is that you can deploy any Azure service. So it's using this Azure Resource Manager abstraction layer in Azure, and it supports any service that you can deploy in, in Azure. And it's also a lot more flexible than the old uh, JSON-based syntax. With um, BICEP, you're a lot closer to Terraform in that you can use modules, you can use um, loops, and many more things in a much more in a much simpler way. But one important uh, difference to um, Terraform is that BICEP does not have state. So BICEP uses the resource manager. It just sends the template to Azure Resource Manager, and this takes care of updating all the resources. OK, so back to our scenario. We want to create a managed identity. We want to access Key Vault. And we want to do everything in BICEP. So first thing we need to do is create a user-assigned managed identity. And this here now is a BICEP resource, or one BICEP file. And here we can yeah, quickly go through the lines. So from one to three are some parameters. So if you want to deploy your BICEP file to multiple environments, you can uh, give it separate um, values. And then we have this resource definition from line five to nine. And that's the BICEP syntax. With resource, you give it a name, and then you have this Azure Resource Manager uh, type and API version. And as we can see here, creating a user-assigned identity is really simple. You only need a name and a location. Tags are optional. The location is for where it's um, 
stored in, in, in Azure Resource Manager and the name to refer to it. So that's step one. We need to create this managed entity. The next step is we need to create our dependency that we want to call. The scenario is we want to use a managed entity to call into Azure uh, Key Vault. For this, I've only shown an extra, an, uh, yeah, some parts of the definition here. But again, we can see that there is this resource definition. It has a name, a lot more properties that are keyword specific. But there is one in there that says, okay, support role-based access. So if you do this with keyword, you can use Azure RPAC assignments to give access to your keyword. And that's what we need to do next. We have created the identity, the source. We have created the target, key vault. Now we want to say that the identity should be able to access the key vault. And this is uh, a lot more complicated, obviously, than doing it through the portal. If you do it with BICEP, you need to first look up the role that you want to assign. In this case, it's key vault secrets user. That's a predefined role in Azure. You can identify it by this GUID that's public. So there's a web page where you can see all the Azure built-in uh, roles. And it's using the existing keyword on the right. So this is not creating a resource. It's referring to the role. And the second resource is creating this assignment. So here we are using the, the properties, the role definition, where we refer to this um, secrets user role, and the principle is from our previous resource. So here in line uh, 13, we are referring back to our um, managed identity and using the principle from there. We also need to tell it that it's a service principle. It could also be an employee, a user. So you can also give your employees access to keyword, and then it would be of a different principle type. So we've created the identity. We've created uh, the target. We allowed it to access the target. So the next step is to assign this identity to our application. Our service needs to be able to call the key vault and identify as that identity. And for this, we are now back to our container app, to our individual service. And this has this identity block from line three to eight, where we can define in a somehow weird syntax in line six, uh, which user assigned identity should be assigned to this container app. You can assign multiple user assigned identities. That's why it's a, a hash table. If you would deploy a system assigned identity, you could also enable it here. That's the type, type user assigned, but there's also system assigned where you do not have to specify anything else. It will just create the identity for you. Okay, so now we have set up everything in Azure. If the identity, we assigned it to the application. We've created the target, we assigned the permissions. So the last step is to actually call invoke the key vault to get some data from there. And for that, we are using .NET in our scenario. And we are using the Azure SDK. So the Azure SDK has um, <coughs> something called Azure Identity that gives you many helper classes for um, using this Azure Identity. Azure SDK exists in many programming languages, Java and so on. So what we can see here in line five is something we'll go further into on the next slide, but we would tell our code that we wanna um, call into Azure. We create a credential and we'll see soon what it does, but we can then pass that credential to our Azure Key Vault SDK and just invoke it, just call get secret. And in the background, it will do the right thing, figure out what managed identity it is in the current application and give you the secret. So yeah, it's uh, really easy to use. There's NuGet packages 
for all this. And um, this default Azure credential is an interesting thing. Again, this exists in every language. And this gives you a very, very convenient way to uh, invoke the keyboard from multiple sources. Because what's interesting is when you run your uh, application locally, you're not within Azure, you're not your managed entity. You are your own user, for example. You're a person. So default Azure credential in the background tries multiple ways. It first checks if there are some environment variables that tell it what identity it should use. And uh, it, that it then tries and checks if it's running in Azure, if it is a managed identity that it can use. But if not, it will try your local um, credentials. So if you use Visual Studio, for example, and if you're signed into Azure, you do not even have to change your code. You can run the application locally, and it will just use the credentials of your person to access the keyboard, for example. So this is really convenient when um, yeah, you have your own dev environment in Azure with the keyboard, for example. You are a contributor. You have the permissions. You can, without changing your code, run it locally, use your identity, and run it in Azure, and use um, the managed identity. Or the app registration, or the service principle, the old ones. They do not go away. Everything um, is done by this default Azure credential. There's also something called interactive browser. So if you're not signed in locally anywhere, but you invoke it from the CLI, for example, it will tell you to sign in. OK, um, back to a screen, a screenshot from Azure. We've now created the Azure identity. We assigned it uh, to an application. And we gave it permissions. We've only shown now one, the keyboard secrets user. But typically, your application would access many things. If we go back to our scenario, we need to pull from Azure Container Registry. We might need to send something to Azure Service Bus and yeah, store data in, in storage, for example. So once you have created this, it's really easy to view in the portal what permissions the managed identity has. OK, so we now looked at how you can use a managed identity in your application to access a dependency. And as a summary, we had to create the identity. We created the target. You must be able to access it, so there needs to be some assignments. You assign it to your application, and you need some code to access it. And that brings me to the next part, which is Workload Identity Federation and how to connect GitHub with, um, with Azure. So far, we've been within Azure. We've used an Azure managed identity in our application that's running in Azure. We develop it. So yeah, Azure can manage it automatically. But GitHub is a different thing. It's owned by Microsoft, but it's different infrastructure. It doesn't live in your tenant. So very recently, so this is only a few months old, they started to roll out Workload Identity Federation to Azure Managed Identity. And the use case for this is whenever you're not running uh, in Azure. So there are some scenarios. Um, GitHub Actions is a big one. There is a lot of documentation on how you can do this. But you can also use it in Kubernetes. Because even though there is Azure Kubernetes service, the cluster is managed by Azure. Your individual applications are Kubernetes resources. You're within your cluster. You have a different API. You use the kube control. CLI, for example. So Azure is not hosting your application. But you can use Workload Identity Federation. And since a few days, it's a GA in AKS as well, so that even your services within AKS can use managed identities. And you can use it for many other things. Um, it's possible with user-assigned managed identities, not system-assigned. 
because system assigned identities are bound to an Azure resource and there is no none. And you can also use it with the older classic app registrations. And what it does is it sets up a trust relationship between two identity providers. And for that, I want to show you this chart and go through the chart. Um, GitHub has its own OpenID Connect provider. And Azure Active Directory is also a OpenID Connect provider. So basically, what you're setting up is you tell your application or managed identity that it trusts something that GitHub tells it the GitHub OpenID Connect provider. So if we are, and we'll see this later, if we are in a GitHub action, it will first go to uh, GitHub, to GitHub's OpenID Connect provider. It will get a regular token, uh, a JSON web token, JVD. But before it will send it to uh, Azure Keyboard, for example, it will send it to Azure Active Directory and the token will be exchanged. So Azure AD, has this federated credentials uh, feature where it knows that it trusts GitHub. And it sends then back an Azure AD or auth token, and that can then be used to access your um, Azure resource. So it's based on trust. And again, um, some screenshots. So if we wanna set this up, we wanna be able to deploy from GitHub to Azure we first again need an identity. So we can set up a user assigned identity that will be used by GitHub to deploy. It has a client ID, object ID, and so on. We have the same requirement. We need to give it access to Azure. So if we wanna deploy from GitHub to Azure, we probably wanna allow it to create resources. So we will set up the contributor role so that it can create whatever it wants. I've also given it user access administrator so it can create new managed identities, so that it can do uh, new assignments because we wanna deploy and automate everything. So if you look at our scenario, GitHub will deploy the services, but the services need their own identity and all of that can be automated. And now comes the important part, uh, and that's the workload identity federation. You need to assign, or you need to set up this trust relationship between the managed identity and um, GitHub. So there is a separate blade, uh, the second one from the bottom, federated credentials on your managed identity, where you can add new federated credentials. And here we see those types again. It's easy with GitHub and Kubernetes, but it supports any other OpenID Connect provider. If you're using it with um, GitHub, you can set up the details of your repository and you will then up, end up with uh, yeah, multiple federated credentials. What we can see here is this entity um, thing. So we see it's uh, bound to branch right now but there is different things that you can set up. You can allow your identity to be, uh, to deploy from an environment, a GitHub environment, separate feature of GitHub Actions, or from branch pull request and tags. And those are the subjects that, that end up there. So if we do this for our scenario, we will uh, get this list. For example, here, we allow this identity to deploy from the main branch and from uh, three GitHub environments. Now we've set up the Azure part. The Azure identity is being created. It has access to the subscription. We set up the trust relationship. Now we need to create the GitHub configuration. And for this, we need to store some config values in GitHub. So we need to store those uh, three values, the client ID, the tenant ID, and the subscription within GitHub. Typically, you would store them as um, secrets 
but they are not secrets because I told you, well, there's no secrets, but now we store something as secret. They are sensitive, I would say. Um, someone who had those three values would not be able to deploy from any GitHub repository. But you still shouldn't just hard code them because, yeah, you wouldn't just give someone your public address, your birth date, uh, if it's not necessary. So we still store them as secrets, but they are not the sole information of authentication. And then we have this, uh, the actual GitHub action. So if we want to do this deployment, we need to set up a GitHub action. It's defined in YAML syntax. I don't know if anyone has uh, used it before. And here we have on line nine, the Azure login action. And this does all the magic basically, but it needs those uh, configuration values. By default, it uses the Azure CLI, but we can also tell it to use Azure PowerShell in line 14. And it will authenticate. So it will give your GitHub action uh, later in line 18, uh, the possibility to just call the Azure API. So here we're just listing Azure uh, resource groups. And yeah, it does the authentication. There's something special on line two and three and four. I told you that it's a trust relationship between two uh, identity providers. So there is this GitHub OEDC provider that creates the first token. And the action needs to be able to read that token to send it to Azure. It needs to send that subject that we've seen before. And that's why that part is uh, necessary. Okay. And um, some final considerations. Those federated credentials need to match. They need to match 100%. So if you tell it that you can deploy from your main branch, it will only allow that. And this makes it a little bit complicated if you want to set up a dynamic system. So if you want to tell uh, GitHub to be able to deploy from any tag or from any branch with a certain pattern, that's not possible right now. It needs to match 100%. So using environments is typically a workaround that you could use right now. And also since there's a limit of 20, um, you cannot just add 100 different uh, pull request branch names and so on. Okay. Um, so summary for this. If you want to use a managed identity from GitHub to deploy to Azure, you create one identity that's, represent, that's representing um, your GitHub action. You allow it to deploy to Azure. You would give it contributor rights or, or whatever you need on your subscriptions. And you set up this trust relationship. You tell Azure that it trusts whatever um, GitHub token information is included. And then on the GitHub side, you, you store those configuration values and use this Azure login action in your workflow. So that's the main things I wanted to show you. Uh, and now I wanna go into uh, a demo and show you how this looks like in a more complicated setup. What I'm going to show you now for the remaining minutes and for the FAQs, I hope you have some questions, uh, is a repository that I've been building uh, um, during my master's thesis, which is a microservice template. It's basically doing exactly what we have uh, seen in the scenario. So it gives you a template for building an Azure container app microservice based system. There is one identity for GitHub that can deploy the entire solution and it, when it deploys the service, deploys the infrastructure and the application. So every service gets its own identity. There's lots of permissions involved and um, it's using the Azure SDKs in code. And everything is uh, in BICEP for, for automation and it also uses some um, Azure PowerShell. So now I will try to uh, switch to duplicate and jump into visual code. Um, and please feel free if you have any questions, 
I don't know where the question box is, but if you already have some questions, we, we can throw around the, the question box. So just let me know. But what I want to show you here is now a bigger solution. So this GitHub repository that I showed you um, has some main points. So there is a, a store for the GitHub actions, and there is this big infrastructure section. And this is the main focus of the template because here I have scripts for deploying uh, the platform, which is the main things you need first, the GitHub identity, a container registry, so everything that's environment independent. And then there's the environments, for example, the container app environment, and then you have the individual services. So if we look at uh, one of those BICEP files, we have, for example, um, here, the GitHub identity that's created. Again, it's a very, very simple um, resource. And we want to deploy now with BICEP those federated credentials that we've seen in the UI. And since we have many, this is a little bit more complicated. BICEP gives you a way to do loops. So if we look at the right here, um, somewhere here, we see that it creates a list of federated credentials. But for whatever reason, Azure does not allow you to send multiple ones in the same, so you have to tell it they only have to be batched and sent one by one. But this list is created up here. So here I'm loading something from a, a config, and then I'm, I'm building a list with concat, so BICEP is quite powerful string functions, array functions, and everything. And here I'm telling it that it's allowed to deploy from the main branch and also from some environments. And um, then I can show you uh, again, here I'm deploying the, the role-based assignments and give it contributor rights and so on. So again, I have to refer to some existing uh, resource so here I had to look up multiple resources. So there's this contributor role in line 16, and all of them are referenced by ID, and they are publicly available on, on this uh, Azure built-in roles page. And uh, yeah, so that's the, the main uh, GitHub identity that's created for the automation. But there's one uh, hen and egg problem. <laughs> if I want to automate the creation of the GitHub managed identity, I cannot do it from GitHub Actions until I have set up this trust relationship. So there is basically only one uh, manual step in this solution that you have to invoke from your computer, and that's this init platform script. You have to invoke this GitHub identity once from your computer, it will set up the trust relationship, it will create this managed identity, and from then on, you can uh, use everything with GitHub. And uh, yeah, one of these workflows is here. So once you've deployed it from your computer the first time, you can redeploy it from a GitHub action. And here, that's the, the simplest one, basically, uh, this will use this Azure login action that we've seen, and it will call some uh, PowerShell that we can look into. It is here. And that's the main thing, the main way how you can invoke a BICEP template. So here we're telling Azure, please uh, invoke this BICEP file on line 19, and we can give it some parameters. In this case, I'm just telling it, no, please don't create the GitHub identity again because we've done this manually, but that's how it works for all the other things as well. Um, if we look maybe at a service, it's uh, similar. 
can we, each service will get a service identity, its own managed entity, and then we can use it um, to assign permissions, for example, on the, on the main uh, container registry. So here I want to assign ACR pool. Again, a weird GUID, and I can assign this uh, permission here. And this can even be done for SQL. So in here, if you're interested, uh, with Azure SQL, you have the additional step of needing to create the schema, the tables and everything. And all of that can be automated as well with managed identities. You can use one admin identity, for example, that has permission on SQL Server to create tables. And you can use your service identity with just uh, read and write permissions, for example. So that's really powerful with, with Azure AD. Um, for example, here, I've, I've also included a script because with Azure SQL, it's a special case. You cannot directly assign uh, permissions to an identity, to a table. You need to create a user in, in your SQL server for your identity. And all of that is automated here as well. So this, this statement here, line 28, create user from external provider, will enable Azure AD authentication in SQL Server. So even here, where you would typically still have a username and password, SQL credentials, you can use Azure Managed Identity. And for example, I've been using uh, Entity Framework Core. It has its own migration schema. And I've used the SQL Admin Identity to apply the migration schema before I deploy the service. And the service can then use this. So with one GitHub action, and without preparing anything, uh, I can deploy the, uh, all the dependencies, the SQL database, can create the schema, can create some initial data, and give the service access to it. Again, without any credentials. Um, maybe if we quickly look at the code of one. The, the, that's templates, so the services are named by what they are doing. Um, but if we look at the launch, script of one of them. Uh, it's in shared, I think. Let me check, because it's used by each of them. I know it's the wrong one that's not using it. Let me jump in here. For example, here I'm using this Azure credential, line 12, where again I'm using it to, um, like, I don't know if you know .NET, but there is data protection keys to use um, uh, protection against form resubmits and so on. So here I'm using this Azure default credential to um, persist keys to Azure blob storage and so on. So again, we've quickly seen how it's used in code, how it's used in bicep, and so on. And with this, I think I'm quite on the spot. Uh, I want to go to questions. So um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to jump into the code or um, yeah, answer some other things that you might have. Yes, just uh, Yes. Do you have a particular situation or can I wrong? Um, um, so we have actually GitHub Actions runner deployed in Azure, and we want to um, assign the admin credential to the VM machine. And basically, it's not used by us, but by our customers. So we provide them these permissions to, to run their workloads on. How would you prevent that they can access? We, we, we still can <coughs> utilize managed identity because we have the service in 
how would you present that uh, first of all to clients and second to clients? Is, uh, is there any way to enable this? I know it's maybe it's not 100% the presentation, but uh, maybe you can do it. So if I understand correctly, you are having the runner, the VM in Azure, and you as a service provider manage that. Yeah. You want to give it a managed identity. Yeah. <coughs> I do not know if the, so that's really now uh, an implementation question of the Azure login action. <coughs> Excuse me. I do not know if that action in the background has access to the VM, for example, if it tries that option as well, or if it always only uh, uses those credentials that are applied to it and Again, it's a question of uh, trust. So your managed identity on the VM um, <clears throat> does not have those federated credentials. So that managed identity does not have an entry that allows one of your GitHub repositories to deploy to Azure. So if, even if Azure Login would support that, it would, and if your uh, customer would know the client ID and so on, the GitHub JVD, the token, would contain a subject that says, okay, I am the GitHub repo customer A slash project A, and there is no such entry in your managed identity. So this trust relationship will fail. Very good question, thank you. <clears throat> any, any other questions? Uh, one hundred percent correct. Yes, there's always a trust container. For example, if you assign a managed identity to a VM, that entire VM can use the managed identity and do whatever it's uh, allowed to do. And for uh, GitHub <coughs> actions, the subject can only be specified as a branch, an environment, pull request, but you cannot specify a subfolder. For example, so yes. The security boundary with uh, this is the repository. So, to how many repositories, or where would you recommend separating process? I mean, in this example, yeah. of course, it's all in one repo. Makes sense for demo. If I use this in production, where would I put? I'm now a consultant, so I can say it depends, obviously. <laughs> uh, it, it really depends on, on what your security boundary is. Like, like you said, here it's a simple application. But if it's a GitHub repository, a mono repo that's um, using many, many different applications, you might even run into those uh, 20 federated credentials limit and so on. So it's probably not a, a good use case in that case. But even if you would use regular application registrations, GitHub, I think, does not give you many ways to store different secrets anyway. So if you store a secret, if you would use classical uh, API keys, your boundary still is the, the GitHub repository. Uh, there was a question back there, I think, and then... Okay, I will repeat the question then. The subject IDs that uh, GitHub reference, you mean? So the question is if you can make those um, uh, subjects, the reference to GitHub, more user-friendly. And via the portal, there was this separate assistant. So here you could say, okay, I want to use a branch and specify the branch. So it made it a little bit simpler. But from the automation, if you use Bicep, that's how it is. That's um, the token that gets sent from, from um, GitHub. GitHub is doing something, but I've not been looking into this. 
where you can transform this uh, token somehow, which might enable you in the future to support like dynamic tags or anything, but that doesn't work with Azure yet. So right now, no, it must match 100%. There was a question here in the front. Yeah, so thank you for the presentation. Uh, I have a question for a token, this token which we actually get in the workflow. Uh, we are in some, um, we do some different deployment, like we deploy the uh, database project and it uh, can also take the long time. So to say, if it takes more than one hour, then the token is actually expires. And uh, do you know for if the token can, or there is some configuration that we can actually make this token takes, or um, how it's called, like takes longer? Extended. Or, yeah, extend that uh, period of token life. The answer is no. There is an open uh, GitHub issue for exactly that. There is some bug in there. I think it even expires after like 10 minutes or something. They said they fixed it, but they didn't. <laughs> so that GitHub issue is still open. If you need something, uh, if you need, if that um, action runs longer than uh, 15 minutes or whatever, I don't know, uh, managed entities do not work properly right now. Okay. And they say they work on it uh, actively, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, thanks. Can I ask a second one? Um, sure. Okay. Uh, if you are, for example, in the logic app world, there is now the, um, Logic App can also run locally in the Azure function runtime, so to say. And uh, if you use something what is managed API, something what is like a REST API service in the Azure, if you use it locally and if you try it locally, you have to assign something other than managed identity because you can't use that locally. Is there a way to use it locally actually? Like mm -hmm. that we use some managed identity because uh, this means or this implies that actually while we deploy, we have to change the way how the things authenticate itself. And uh, this is not possible for everything in the logic app. And this is a hard problem, for example, for a HTTP action or something like that, uh, that you can't exchange those stuff. Is there a way to use or to say that on the, on the local machine, in my local development, I actually use or say that this is uh, Azure versus, yeah? I do not know that uh, because that would be a feature of Azure Logic Apps. Uh, I've only shown the, the SDK part. So whenever you're using some custom program, that Azure default yeah, credential is, yeah. takes care of that. But I do not know how it works in Azure, Azure Logic Apps, but they would have to support this. Okay, yeah. yeah. Any more questions? really fun to catch, so <laughs> if you don't have questions. One more question, thank you, yeah. Mm, no, yeah. Do you know how the, the managed ident, or, <laughs> so you said the Azure SDK is available for multiple languages, and now we run some application within the container how, how does the secrets in the end get inside the code? Is this passed through some environment variables? So where I'm coming from is, um, this reminds me a lot how HashiCorp Vault can inject secrets into your containers, and they, for instance, have a qu quite some dance to, to pass these secrets very securely into the right process within the container. Um, so what I'm asking is, do you think another process within the same container could maybe maliciously use the same uh, managed identity? Um, so there is the, there is each service does it differently. So for Azure VM, so the question is how does Azure do this internally, basically, yeah? And for Azure VM, there is a service called Instance Metadata Service, I think. So there's a special HTTP endpoint that your VM exposes within the VM. It's something 169 dot something, I don't know. But everyone on the VM can invoke that HTTP URL and get the token back. So the security boundary is, is that. And that Azure uh, default credential, when it's using the managed identity part, is using that. So that's just for Azure VM. For Azure container apps, for example, 
I don't know how they do it because that's completely abstracted away. They inject this into the uh, app somehow with containers, like with Azure Container Service. The, the, it's again this tr trust relationship. So the, the um, token is not injected, only the Kubernetes JVD is injected. So the service will ask the Kubernetes OpenID Connect provider for its Kubernetes token. And then this dance is happening where the Azure ID um, uh, provider checks the token, checks if the credentials match and gives back the Azure token. Uh, so it depends, the answer is it depends on the service. Any more questions? Uh, not, uh, not the secrets, no, yeah. Okay, if there are no more questions, uh, I'd like to say thank you very much for your attention. I hope it was useful, and uh, thank you.